You're always so kind with compliments and thank yous after messages on Sunday. I hope you do that with all the guys who uh, lead us in worship. They've done so well this morning. Appreciate each one of them and, um, and their leadership of us before God's throne. I uh, always love when our song leaders lead Jesus Loves Me. It's one of our songs in worship because uh, uh, if I happen to be within eye range of the little ones, when that song starts the first couple of notes, the response from the little ones, heads up, I know that one. And they, they love to participate in that song and uh, often you can hear them singing above the rest of us. That's a wonderful thing. That's one of the most influential songs ever written and most uh, widely known about every culture in our world uh, knows that song and what a great song. It's probably only in our time, modern times, that people have ever considered a good rainstorm as a curse. Uh, you know how it is, you, you have something planned, you have a picnic planned, something outdoors, and, and your thought is, I hope it doesn't rain. Or uh, a golf outing, is it supposed to rain? Or a trip to the beach, let's just hope it doesn't rain all week long. Somehow I can't imagine Abraham tuning into Weather Channel and fretting about the Doppler radar readouts. Uh, I doubt Moses was much concerned about a shower or two. And Noah, well, maybe Noah had some rain issues, but, but that's another sermon. Rain was vital in the ancient world, especially in the land of the Bible, which is very arid climate, very dry, and, and a lot of it is desert, and so they're in, in great need of rain. And so they prayed for rain and a lot of times built their religion around it. And when it came, they praised God. And, and in, in the land of the Bible, the, the people look forward to the two rainy seasons of the year, and when they didn't come, uh, they were greatly distressed. So they thought about the, the former rains, they called the former rains, they came around October, and, and that sort of preceded their time of planting. And then the latter rains came about April and, and uh, preceded the time of harvest. And for them, this is how serious it was. When the rains didn't come, people could die. Uh, famine arose, no food. Drought was much more feared than things we fear, like a tornado or a severe thunderstorm. So it shouldn't surprise us that, that rain and drought play a major role in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. Sometimes actual rainstorms or droughts play a, a role in the story itself that, that we read. And, and many times just the image of rain or drought is used as an illustration of something deeper since the people were so familiar with it and it was such a part of their uh, daily existence. And that's the case with our lesson this morning, uh, the text of our lesson. It comes from the book of Hosea, who's the first of what we call the minor prophets, uh, minor just meaning shorter prophets, and he's located right after Daniel in your Old Testament. If you want to open Hosea, we'll be reading there in just a moment. Hosea chapter 6 in particular is a call to the people of, his, of, of his day to, to repent and to fully turn to the Lord God of Israel. I want us to begin uh, in Hosea chapter 6 with verses 4, 5, and 6 in, in our reading there. It begins this way, What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? 
Your love is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes away early. Therefore, I have hewed them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and my judgment goes forth as the light. For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offering. We're dealing with, in this text, uh, unfaithfulness, and and punishment is coming to the people for their unfaithfulness, and really the only chance to avoid the punishment is is to respond in in the way that the chapter opens, verses 1 through 3, and that's really the text that I want us to spend our time on this morning, so let's, let's see how the chapter opens. Verse 1, come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us, that he may heal us. He has struck us down, and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up, that we may live before him. Let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. His going out is as sure as the dawn. He will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. Do you hear the forecast in those verses? The forecast is for rain. Not rain from the clouds or or rainfall as such, but R-E-I-G-N, the reign or the rule of God. God is in control, Israel, Hosea is saying to them. He's trying to remind them of that fact. God is in control, not Baal, that was the false god that they were worshiping. That was what was making them unfaithful. Uh, they worshiped him because they thought he brought rain. And, and Hosea is trying to remind them, no, it's your God, Israel. So Baal's not in control or any other so-called power, but it's the Lord God. He's the one who reigns. I think that's a message that we desperately need still today. I think that's something we have to understand. We may not be struggling with Baal worship, but we're struggling with some things. God reigns. God is in control. It's not politicians. It's not government. It's not the boss at work. It's not the stock market. Not anything but God. And his reign is certain. There's no real question about it. Our God reigns. Well, how do we know that? Well, just like a meteorologist would, we look to the signs. See, here in Hosea 6, verse 1, it says that we we know God reigns because He punishes his people. Did you notice that? Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us, that he may heal us. He has struck us down, and he will bind us up. We know God's in control because sometimes he punishes his people. Then verse 2 says, we know God reigns because he restores and revives his people. You notice it there. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. And then verse 3 says, we know God reigns because he is such a certain thing. Let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. His going out is as sure as the dawn. He will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. I want us to focus especially on that last verse, verse 3. 
and how the point is driven home, the fact that God is such a certain thing, something we can count on. Just like Hosea says we can count on the sun to rise in the morning. Isn't it wonderful to be able to see it? Just as, as we can count on the refreshing seasonal showers and spring rains, we can count on the fact that God is in charge of his world, that he is in charge of this universe, and in fact, actively rules over it. I think we need that message because our world seems out of control. If we're paying attention, if we're reading the paper, or watching the news, or if we're just experiencing life, it seems like things are in chaos. And so we need this message in a world full of wars and terrorist attacks and just the craziness of, of, of life, the violence that surrounds us, families struggling, families tearing apart, traditional values about things being trampled upon and mocked. It can make us seem can make it seem to us that God isn't paying attention, isn't in control. Maybe someone else is really in charge. But the message of Scripture to the Christian is still our God reigns. You can count on it. He's still in charge. In fact, he's coming back. He's coming back here one day soon to demonstrate this truth in a definite and final way. That is a certainty as sure as the dawn and the spring rains, the Lord is coming. I'd like you to hear some other scriptures on this. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 says that the Lord Jesus is going to be revealed and here's what it specifically says. He's going to be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction, separated from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes to be glorified by his saints and to be marveled at on that day by all who have believed. You see, our God reigns. There is a day coming when this will be revealed in a powerful and visible and awe-inspiring way, both to those who have worshipped and obeyed him and to those who have not. No one is going to be left in any doubt when this is revealed. I'd like you to also listen to some verses from the Apocalypse. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. Our God reigns. Even those who murdered Jesus and who in effect murder him over and over today by the way they live, even they will see him and acknowledge him when he comes back. Revelation 11, verse 15. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Our God reigns. And finally, Revelation chapter 19, verse 6. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the sound of many waters and like the sound of mighty thunder peals, 
crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Our God reigns. And as a bonus, chapter 22 and verse 20, the one who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Our God reigns. So our God reigns. That is certain. And he's coming back one day soon to prove it again for a final time. How do we live until then? Hosea, I think, states it well in verse 3 of our text. If our God reigns, and he does, if he's in charge, and he is, if he controls things, how do we respond? What do we do? How do we behave as we wait for his final return? Hosea says, verse 3, let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. How do we respond to God? We seek to know him. Not just know about him, you see. Not just, not just memorize a list of facts or verses about him, but to know him. The word to know that's used here speaks of an intimate knowledge. So intimate that it was used uh, in the Old Testament, book of Genesis and other places, to describe the intimate knowledge, intimate relationship of a husband and a wife. Now, there's nothing, of course, sexual about our relationship with God, but there had better be something deeply intimate about it. Superficialities don't cut it when it comes to knowing God. Let me reflect on it this way with you. I had a friend ministry friend in uh, West Virginia that knew as much about Abraham Lincoln as anyone that I had ever met and could just recall things he had said or, or stories about him and uh, use them frequently in illustrating scripture and so forth. And just Lincoln was his hero and he had read and studied his life extensively. Uh, but my friend Tom had never met Lincoln, of course, uh, Never shook his hand, never shared a meal with him, never talked with him. Had no intimate knowledge of Lincoln like Lincoln's wife did or like Lincoln's children did or as other contemporaries did. There's a difference in knowing some things about a person and really knowing them. There is a difference in knowing some things about God and knowing God. Knowing God intimately must be our lifelong pursuit as believers, as Christians. It's much more than an intellectual pursuit or, or, or exercise but, but an intimate relationship that comes by living with him and living for him and it has to be persistently pursued through things like prayer and study and worship and, and, and quiet time with him. Hosea says it this way. He says, let us press on to know the Lord. The results of not knowing him are devastating. And they're all around us today. When we look at the, the mess uh, in people's lives, when we look at the mess in our world, this is evidence of not knowing God. They were devastating also in Hosea's day. If you look back at chapter 4 of Hosea, uh, verse 1 there, he talks about the fact that there is no knowledge of God in the land. 
And then he goes on and he catalogs the results in the following verses. He makes a list of the things that are a result of not knowing God. He talks about swearing, lying, murder, stealing, adultery, death, destruction. Sound familiar? Okay, these come when people don't know the Lord. When we talk about knowing God, we are not talking about being able to pass a Bible quiz or a religious test. Believe me, I have known people, I know people who can do that. They were Bible Bowl champions. They don't know God a lick. We're not even talking about knowing all the right verses and being able to quote those verses from memory. We're, we're, we're not referring to having every doctrine of Scripture down 100% right. We are talking about pursuing a real abiding relationship with the God of the universe. See, Israel at this time could... They could have passed every religious quiz you threw at them. But they didn't please God. They knew exactly what God required and when in worship. But God destroyed them anyway. Because they didn't know God. Chapter 6, verse 6. God says to them, For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice the knowledge of God rather than burn offerings. And in, in case you doubt, our Lord Jesus said the same thing. John chapter 17, verse 3, his great prayer to the Father, Jesus said, listen to him, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life is knowing God. And this knowledge, once again, is a lifelong pursuit. It doesn't come in a flash. We might wish it would. Now, the Apostle Paul saw a flash once, a brilliant light. While he was on the road to Damascus, God confronted him. But he didn't know God yet. He didn't get to know him until he spent about three years with him in Arabia. Go read Paul's life. Read Acts. Read his letters and you'll see there was this period after his conversion where God revealed himself to him and prepared him for service. And, and see, you won't know him five minutes after your baptism anywhere close to as deeply as you will five years afterward if you truly pursue that relationship with him. Our God reigns. Our response is get to know him. Pursue a vital, personal relationship with him. Obey him. Stay close to him all your life. Get to know him intimately. In reality, there are two pursuits that are going on. Indeed, we're to press on to know the Lord. But folks, since the day you were born, in fact, if Scripture is true, and it is, since the day you were conceived, the Lord God has been pursuing you. He wants to reign in your life. He wants a relationship with you. He was after you before you knew anything about him. And he so much wants a relationship with you that he took on flesh in Jesus Christ. And he left that heavenly throne. Name another king who ever did that. He left that heavenly throne and came down here. He allowed people like you and me to kill him. All to make it possible for us to have a real relationship with him. If we'll just pursue it. 
if we'll just pursue it. Don't accept a cheap imitation. Whether it's some flimsy, modern spirituality that is popular at the time. It seems like every five years it cycles into a new form. Or whether it's some dead, cold legalism. Neither one is any good. Seek out the real thing. A living relationship with the God of the universe and his son, Jesus Christ. God reigns today. Are you a part of his kingdom? If we can help you with that, if we can study with you, if we can baptize you into Christ or welcome you back into his fold, the invitation and the lesson this morning is yours. It's your opportunity now to respond. Let us stand and sing.